Hi students, welcome to our first tutorial about animation or the movement of objects in our 3D scenes. So before we get started with actual animation, uh, there's a few things that I want to review um, that we've talked about in a few of the other classes, but now we're actually going to start to connect some of these elements together that we've been learning about. So um, the first thing that I want to review with you is the idea of our gizmo and our transform tool. So I'm just going to make a basic teapot and put it in the center of the scene there at the origin and um, make sure that it's right at the middle by making my x, y, and z zero. And uh, so let's take a look and review what the transformation tools are. Um, we haven't really called them this in a very long time, but our basic move, rotate, and scale are our three basic transformations. And we've been using those um, to transform geometry for the purpose of creating things like our snowman scene um, and stuff like that. However, these are the same tools that we're going to use to have objects move and do things. So in our initial lesson, we're gonna stick with movement um, in all three directions and how to get an object to move. Um, so before we talk about actual movement, uh, we're actually going to rewind all the way back to an earlier unit where we were practicing with stop motion animation. Um, we were talking about frame rate and talking about creating the illusion of movement um, by changing the position of an object little by little over the course of each individual frame of a video. This is, of course, the most basic principle of animation. Now, in 3ds Max, um, the same rules apply, uh, however the computer does sometimes make that a little bit easier for us than, say, when we were working on stop motion with a physical object in real life. Um, so before we start doing our actual animation, there are some parameters on the bottom right side of the screen that I'm sure many of you have notice but maybe not sure what they do, um, we are going to set up our scene to make sure that everything is the way we want it to do a very simple animation of our teapot moving from left to right, um, like it's gliding across a floor. So this little clock with the gear down here called time configuration, we're going to click on that. Now it brings up a menu with all sorts of important things here. Now we generally want to have it on custom and for our class we're going to stick with 30 frames per second. Uh, we could technically define any frame rate we want um, but we're going to stick with 30 and we're making sure that we're in frames. Okay, some of these other measurements and other um, ways of keeping track of time relate to uh, live action video, and these pertain particularly to if you're trying to create graphics that you're trying to integrate within live action footage. Um, but since we're just creating a straight animation, we are not worried about any of that. Now, we also have the ability to decide how long our animation is going to be in frames. So right now, we can see just by default, it created a 125 frame animation. And at 30 frames per second, that math doesn't really add up. So let's make that simpler. We have 30 frames per second as our frame rate, and we want our clip of our teapot moving to last three seconds. 3 times 30 is 90. Okay, so 90 frames gives us 3 seconds of animation. Okay, now we can see that our timeline has changed and now we have frame 0 to 90. So another thing that we want to check uh, before we get started is to click on the filters button. What does the filters button do? Well, um, we can tell the software to pay attention to all sorts of things um, when we're setting up animation. Um, but for our purposes, all we care about for this initial lesson is position. So make sure that nothing else is checked except position. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. Okay, so now that we have those couple settings set the way that we want to, um, I'm not going to explain kind of why we care about that. 
Uh, so in animation, particularly in 3ds Max, Maya, Blender, any of those 3D programs, as well as in a bunch of the Adobe programs, you might hear the frame or the phrase keyframing. And a keyframe is basically a snapshot of a scene in time. And if you guys remember when we were doing our stop motion uh, videos, we had to move our coin every little step of the way over the amount of frames that we needed to complete our movement. And that got really tedious and it was really challenging. So with the 3D software, it's a little bit more straightforward than that. So say we want our teapot to start over here and then by the end of our three seconds to go to the other side of the grid. Instead of having to move a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit like we would have to if we were doing a stop motion video, we can basically create a keyframe at the start of the animation where we want the teapot to start and then bring our time slider all the way to the end, move our teapot to where we want it to end up by the end of the animation, do another keyframe, and then we let the software do the rest. It's a beautiful thing. So let's give it a try. So let's bring our teapot back to where it looks like it's sitting on the edge of our little starting grid there. And we are going to do the set key option. There's another one called auto key that will basically create keyframes for everything you do and that can get out of control really quickly. So we're gonna stick with our manual keyframes. So we see our time slider bar turning red, almost like a record. So basically the software is waiting for us to say, yep, our object is where we want it to be for our keyframe. And since it is, we're gonna click the press keyframe button. And if you notice, this little guy appeared here. Cool. So we're gonna drag our time slider all the way to the end. Then we're gonna move our teapot along the x-axis so that it looks like it's sitting on the other side. And then we're gonna do one more keyframe. So you can see now we have one on one side and one on the other. Watch what happens when we drag our time slider back. The teapot moves along with it. So let's play back that animation. There you have it. And it tends to loop it. That's a setting you can turn off, but I'm not going to bother. All right, so that's it. So say you want to make a change to the movement of the teapot. Maybe you want it to move uh, farther, for example. Maybe we want it to actually go off to the left here and disappear off of the frame. It's very easy to accidentally drop two keyframes next to each other. So you have to pay attention to where your keyframe is. Okay, and since we have such a short timeline, it's not easy to get mixed up because it pretty much ticks along each frame individually. But if you have like a thousand frame sequence, this gets to be really small. So you have to make sure that if we want to edit the last frame of our animation, um, we have our yellow bar, our time slider indicating that we are in fact at that last moment. That way, when we move our teapot off this, um, the thing and we set the new key, it basically overwrites the old one instead of creating another one next to it. Because if you create another one next to it, weirdness can happen. Actually, I'll show you what can happen. Um, let's see, can I undo? Yeah. So say I accidentally drop the time slider not over top of the old one and I bring my teapot off the edge and I'm like, great, I'm gonna set my new keyframe and I'm gonna play back my animation and watch what happens when our time slider gets to the end. We think it's all good, but then it, do you see at the end, it really quickly moved the teapot back to that other spot because that old keyframe was still hanging around. So if you ever have that happen where you accidentally create an extra keyframe that you don't want, you can always click that one, right click it and say delete all and then it'll go away. Another handy thing is you can actually pick up keyframes and drag them around in the timeline. So say you want the movement of that teapot to happen after the first 30 frames or the first second of animation, you can actually just move that teapot there, move that keyframe right over there and now it zooms out of there much faster. And then maybe we can add more to our animation. So after the second se second second ha, we can move the teapot back to where we started, stop it, and then at the end of the animation, maybe we want it to zoom like it's in reverse off to the other side. Whoop. 
Away it goes. One more keyframe. So now we have a little bit more of a complicated animation. Teapot zooms forward, then backwards, and that's it. All right. Now, we just happen to assign movement in only the x direction. However, if we wanted to get a little fancier with this, and this is where, again, your multiple viewports are going to come in really handy. Um, you saw that just now I used the top um, or the front viewport uh, so that I didn't change my perspective. Um, right now, uh, your like if we went maybe halfway, so after the first half a second, Maybe we want the teapot to move into the distance so it sort of makes like an S. See, I'm looking at it from the top. I can move my Y direction, make another keyframe. Boom. So now the teapot kind of does like a little swerve thing. And then maybe we want it to jump up when it hits here. So you can see that you can the when you're doing animation you can sort of start with your basic idea and then you can keep fine tuning and making changes as you go. So there you have it. So in our next video, we're going to take a look at our two types of groupings, our hierarchies with linking and our groups themselves to take a look at how we can use both of those groups to create different effects in animation. Uh, that's it.